Well, we'll make a start. Um, so I'm um, Steve McGilvery. I'm an associate professor in the Substance Use Research Unit in the University of Dundee in Scotland. It's uh, an honour and a privilege to be here to chair this session, which will um, run very much on time, I hope. We've got four presenters, 15 minutes for each, which a 12 minute presentation and three minutes for questions. Um, I hope we do have some questions. We've also got potentially some people joining online, so I'll try and manage questions from there too. So without um, further ado, um, I'll ask the, the first of our um, presenters to come up um, in this um, session on illicit drug use and treatment. And it's Dr. Kriana Bachrat, who um, just recently got your PhD in uh, 2023, so congratulations on, on that. Um, I believe you're an applied biostatistician. Um, and apparently there's quite a few of these around in NDARC. I'm, I'm surprised at how many there are. Um, and your, um, your current research program is really a range of epidemiological studies. That's, that's your kind of bag, isn't it? Uh, and population-linked data. And you're going to tell us about a, a meta-analysis and systematic review, which I have recently read the paper, so I'm familiar with this. Um, looking at biological samples um, versus kind of standard samples. So, please, up to you. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, as has been mentioned earlier today, there was a large team involved in this review, uh, so I'd like to start by acknowledging them. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we are on, the Gadigal people, and extend that respect to elders past and present. I'd also like to thank and acknowledge all of the authors and the study participants in the studies that we included in this review, and just uh, note that I have no declarations of interest. So studies of illicit drug use often rely on self-report. This is because it provides a convenient, relatively inexpensive and non-invasive way of obtaining detailed information about people's illicit drug use behaviours. Even so, questions around the reliability of these measures are often raised. And this can be due to reasons of social undesirability of drug use or potential negative consequences. Although biological measures may be considered more objective, so this is the detection of biochemical markers in biological measures, these detection methods, biochemical testing, are not perfect and discrepancies when compared with the self-report cannot always be attributed to misreporting of use by a person. To date, evidence for agreement between self-report and biologically tested drug use have been limited to specific populations or specific uh, self-report instruments. So the aim for this study was to examine the evidence for agreement between self-reported and biologically measured illicit drug use among all biological indicators, populations, settings, and major illicit drug classes. So we were excluding alcohol and tobacco, as well as novel psychoactive substances. So consider the cross-tabulation of self-reported drug use, which are the rows, and biological test result, which here are the columns. We have the two scenarios where the measures agree, and that can be either that both are positive or both are negative, and this is an evaluation of overall agreement. We also looked at metrics which condition on different measures. So we'll consider the measures that condition on the biological test result, and these relate to sensitivity and specificity measures. To examine the extent to which biological test results differ from self-reported drug use at the individual level, we also examined rates of uh, false discovery and false omission. So that being the proportion reporting use that tests negative, so that's the false discovery in the top right, and the proportion reporting no use that test negative, uh, test positive, sorry, uh, and that's false emission. 
And just to note that the terms false discovery and false emission in this context are standard terms used to describe these metrics. They are not to be interpreted as suggesting that the self-report was necessarily false. The final aim of this study was to also examine heterogeneity of study effects. So how does agreement vary according to whether there were consequences for reporting use, whether they were informed that biological testing would occur prior to providing self-report, the time frame of the self-reported drug use, and also the study population. So just a quick run through of the methods. So as I mentioned, comparisons of the same major drug class, any studies that made these comparisons. And we looked at the peer-reviewed databases as well as the gray literature. We used the QUADIS-2, or the Quality Assessment of Diagnostic Accuracy Studies tool, to measure risk of bias. And we used various random effects modeling frameworks to evaluate the pooled estimates and 95% confidence intervals. For urine and saliva, we focused on analyses on two time intervals of self-reported drug use. So first, anywhere between past one and past four days self-reported drug use, as this aligns most closely with the detection window for most testing procedures. And secondly, we examined past month self-reported drug use, as this is a common time frame used in epidemiological studies. Analyses of hair included all studies regardless of the self-reported time frame. So on to the interesting stuff. From just under 8,000 studies, a, a total of 207 were deemed eligible. Of these, most were from the regions of North America and Western Europe. Most often urine was the biological uh, measure reported on. Self-report was most often collected using either single question or experimenter devised scales compared to or versus validated instruments. Cocaine was the most commonly reported drug type. And most studies were classified as research studies with no consequences. Looking at risk of bias, we found that across most of the domains, studies were evaluated as being at low risk of bias. The exception was the reference standard, which for over half of the studies included in this review were considered at high risk of bias. And what this means is that, well, for most of those studies that considered at high risk of bias, they were using drug screening tests, which may misclassify results in either direction. On to overall agreement. So for comparisons of urine, we found that pooled estimates for overall, of overall agreement were generally high, with past one to four day use, which is shown in yellow, of methamphetamine, heroin, and opioids assessed as excellent. Past month use of these drugs, as well as cannabis and cocaine, were assessed as very good. In all cases, overall agreement of past one to four days was higher than past month. For overall agreement of measures of saliva, we found that for all of the major drug classes shown here, agreement was assessed as excellent. Results were more variable for hair, ranging from good for cannabis and cocaine, very good for methamphetamine and heroin, and excellent for opioids. There's a lot of results there, but combining those all together, what we can see is that for the various drugs considered and for the different biological measures considered, overall agreement was generally good to excellent. Now looking at the measures that conditioned on the biological test result, these being sensitivity and specificity. We found that uh, for specificity, measures ranged from good to excellent, and measures of sensitivity were generally very good as well, with the exception of cocaine, which was considered, uh, was assessed as being in good agreement. When we looked a little bit further into that measure of cocaine, however, we found some interesting results. So I know that this is a very busy slide, I'll try and break it down. So in the middle, we have sensitivity, 
On the far right, we have specificity measures, and the different colors indicate different groupings of study types. So I'm going to zone in on two, the yellow being research studies with no consequences, and the orange being criminal justice settings. What we found when we looked at measures of sensitivity by these different study groups, we found that research studies with no consequences were assessed as being at good, in uh, having good measures of sensitivity. In comparison with measures, uh, studies in criminal justice settings, we found that measures of sensitivity were poor. So this just really highlights the importance of considering the context in which these measures are collected when considering the agreement between the measures. Looking now to measures that condition on self-report, and these being false discovery and false omission. And in this context, while sensitivity and specificity values closer to one are better, for a false omission and false discovery rate, smaller values are better. So looking here, we can see that rates of false discovery ranged from good to excellent, with the exception of methamphetamine, which we can see there in the light peachy color. False emission rates were generally excellent among research studies with no consequences. Noting, however, that randomized controlled trials examining cocaine, false emission rates were poor, while false discovery rates were excellent. Looking at how these measures of agreement varied according to features of the study design, we found that longer timeframes of self-reported drug use tended to provide better agreement. And this aligns with what we might, uh, this suggests that people may be more comfortable reporting drug use perceived as being more temporally distant to the time of self-report. We found that agreement tended to be higher among studies with a high proportion of people who use drugs. And we might expect this when either uh, high drug use or drug dependence is a condition of entry into the study, where then the, uh, the reporting of drug use within that study is, it's already been uh, acknowledged as a condition of entry into that study. We found that agreement tended to be higher in trials and situations with no consequences. And we also found that people tended to provide, or agreement tended to be higher when people were informed that they would be tested prior to providing their self-report. Just to acknowledge some of the limitations around this study, so despite a comprehensive search strategy, we may not have identified all available data an agreement may have varied by features of the study which weren't available to us at the time. For example, the metabolites that were tested during the biological testing. One minute, Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, most of the studies were conducted in North America and Western Europe, so, and the evidence base is also highly heterogeneous. So it is not representative of all countries and all regions or country income levels. Um, and so that's a consideration in thinking about the generalizability of these findings. And finally, we cannot be confident that all included studies were only capturing illicit and or extra medical drug use. Some reports of use and or detection of substances in the biological samples may have been drugs used under the direction of a medical professional. There may also have been some variation in the legal status of these drugs across the various studies and timeframes. In conclusion, the results from this review demonstrate that agreement between self-report and biological measures of drug use is high. Given the relative benefits of measuring drug use via self-report in terms of reduced cost and increased convenience, self-report pro provides a really useful measure of illicit drug use for research purposes. That being said, we did observe considerable variation between drug classes, biological indicators, and the populations which really highlights two things, considering the suitability of biological testing methods in relation to their limitations, and also confirming that when screening tests are used, where there are consequences or uh, decisions being made as a result of that screening test, 
those should be validated using laboratory tests as well. The paper is published. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much. Um, I forgot to say to the presenters that if you run over the 12 minutes, then security will escort you from the building. So well done. That was bang on time. So we've got three minutes for questions. Any questions? I've got a couple. Hey, uh, great talk. Um, I just wanted to ask whether there was any variation around sort of uh, consumers with a history of chronic use versus those uh, maybe infrequent consumers and whether there was sort of low agreement within those short time frames with those people that may have some sort of residual um, metabolites as a result of their chronic use? Yeah, so that touches, a uh, great question, that touches on two different aspects, I guess. So yeah, we definitely observed better agreement among studies that had people with uh, higher, whether the cohort was defined as people with drug dependence or who use quite frequently. Um, we didn't have information in a way that we could characterize those cohorts in any more level of detail than that. But that being said, yes, there is a, the potential for the metabolites to be residual. And that's, as I mentioned at the beginning, the discrepancies may not necessarily be um, due to the misreporting of the individual. It may be a delayed effect or detection of that drug in the body. Thanks. Great. Um, well, Kriana, I'd just like to congratulate you on the review because, I mean, I'm a systematic reviewer. I get it. I like sort of making order from chaos. And that's kind of what you did. The heterogeneity was rife throughout that. So, and you've told a nice, neat story. One, one thing a bit unclear was um, you categorized um, the studies, some of the studies as without consequences. What, what did that mean? Yeah, so um, a priori, we expect that willingness to disclose uh, drug use would depend on the participants' uh, perception of how their uh, self-reporting may be used. So in evaluating or extracting the data, we considered whether the uh, purpose for collection, the people doing the data collection, or the potential uh, setting or ramification or the consequences for reporting may be perceived by the participant to result in negative consequences. And so where that was the case, we identified or um, classified those studies as being at potential risk of negative consequences. And so for the studies where that wasn't present, we classified those studies as at being no consequence for the individual. So not a, not a concrete solid measure, but yeah. sort of trying to capture those um, setting specific things that otherwise wouldn't be able to be evaluated. No, that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Any other burning questions? We've got time for one very quick one. Nope. Well, that's great. We're on time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank thanks you. Thanks again. Okay. Well, our next presenter. Sorry, the, the presentations are the wrong way around. Oh, okay. How's that? Okay. Um, so this is uh, this is Paige, and I believe Paige, you um, you recently started your PhD um, in 2022, um, and I, I did think when I looked at this, I thought this has got all the hallmarks as presentation patterns of drug use among people who inject drugs, a systematic review of meta-analysis of early chapters of your PhD. But actually, you worked as a research uh, officer in NDARC for a few years before that, and this is that kind of research? Yeah. So, Unfortunately, you don't cross over enough. <laughs> no? Okay. Well, looking forward to hearing about it. So, um, please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming along to this breakout session over the others. Um, so yeah, as stated, my name's Paige and I'm a PhD candidate as well as a research officer at NDARC. And today I'll be presenting a systematic review of the patterns of drug use in people who inject drugs globally. 
I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the country that we're all on, the Gadigal people, and to recognise their continuing connections to lands, waters and communities, and recognise that their sovereignty was never ceded. I pay my respect to elders past and present and extend that respect to any First Nations people with us today. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. I would also like to thank the huge amount of people that were involved in this study as well as the primary study that I will touch on in a minute. Um, in particular, I would like to thank Jeremy Ireland who did a lot of the analysis for this work and has recently embarked on his own PhD adventure in the US. So the study that I'm gonna be talking about today is a secondary analysis of uh, a systematic global review of injecting drug use and characteristics of people who inject drugs that was published by Louisa Degenhardt earlier this year. Uh, so in this paper, we generated estimates of the number of people who inject drugs globally. Um, and then we also generated prevalence estimates of bloodborne viruses, um, risk behaviors and socio-demographic characteristics of people who inject drugs as well. Um, so this review did present estimates of recent use of heroin, amphetamines and cocaine, um, but these estimates did not factor in routes of administration. So the aim of this paper is to generate more thorough analysis of global patterns of drug use, including injecting, non-injecting and smoking use um, of various drug types. So from the uh, Dengenhart review, we estimated that there were 14.8 million people who inject drugs globally, which accounts for approximately 0.3 of the global population. And we know that people who use drugs often use various types of drugs and various routes of administration as well. Despite the prevalence of non-injecting drug use, however, Harms associated with these routes of administrations are, are largely ignored in lieu of focusing on injecting related harms. Furthermore, there is also a lack of harm reduction interventions that target non-injecting drug use specifically. The use of legal drugs, including alcohol and tobacco, is also um, associated with very high levels of harm and is also often not considered in the research as well. Establishing harm reduction and treatment interventions that consider the complex profile of drug use among people who use drugs is necessary in order, in order to improve the health and well-being of this population. So this review aimed to generate national, regional and global estimates um, of drug use among people who inject drugs, including a range of substances and routes of administration. Uh, so this review was consistent with PRISMA and GATHER guidelines and involved an extensive uh, search process which included peer review and grey literature databases, uh, email and social media callouts to experts in the field, as well as extensive consultation with a few key international organisations including WHO, UNODC, UNAIDS, EMCDDA, Harm Reduction International and Global Fund. Just a few acronyms for you. Um, so for the current review, I included studies that implemented a survey among people who inject drugs, which included an estimate of at least one drug type in a specified time frame. So for this, we considered uh, both recent use, which was defined as within the, pre the past 12 months, um, as well as lifetime use. Although for this presentation, I'm just gonna focus on the recent use. Uh, we also considered any or unspecified use, injecting use, smoking use, and non-injecting, and so, yeah, non-injecting use. And I'll just note that the non-injecting use estimates do not include smoking use, as these were considered separately. So we generated estimates of heroin, amphetamines, which included methamphetamine, cocaine, cannabis, alcohol, and tobacco. So for each of these time frame, uh, route of administration and drug type combinations, we generated country level estimates through Stata using a random effects meta-analysis. If multiple estimates for the same combination were available in the same country, we pulled those estimates. And then we generated regional estimates by pooling all of the country level estimates within a region 
accounting for the population size of each country. And finally, global estimates were calculated by pooling together all the regional estimates accounting for the regional population size. Um, all right, so onto the results. So we had more estimates for recent heroin use than any other drug. There were 99 estimates from 49 countries. Uh, so just in these maps that you'll see throughout the slide, the dark gray countries are countries where we have found no evidence of injecting drug use. The lighter gray is countries where we have evidence of injecting drug use, but not an estimate of the specific drug that we're talking about. And then the blue slides, in the, the blue color, sorry, indicates the prevalence of use, with the darker blue indicating a higher prevalence of use. Uh, so the global prevalence of recent any heroin use was 85%, and estimates were relatively consistent across regions, with the exception of Australasia, in which approximately 50% of people who inject drugs had recently used heroin. Um, in terms of the route of administration data, I will just note that there was very limited data availability for these, so these should be taken very lightly. Um, so in terms of the estimates that we do have, injecting use of heroin was much higher than the other two forms of administration that we considered. Moving on to amphetamines, um, data availability was lower um, than for heroin, but we did find 70 estimates across 36 countries. Um, and the global estimate of amphetamine use was 55%, although there was a lot more regional variation in this than with heroin. Uh, so we had approximately a quarter of people who inject drugs in Europe and the Middle East and Africa, which is the yellow and green. And then um, in East, East and Southeast Asia and North America, um, it was closer to three quarters. And with the routes of administration, the pattern's quite different than it was for heroin. Um, so smoking was the highest estimate of about 40% of people who inject drugs. And then uh, fewer than a quarter had recently used through injecting. So for cocaine, we had the second highest data availability after heroin. So we had 75 estimates in 41 countries, although we found no estimates for Central Asia. So just over a third of people who inject drugs globally had recently used cocaine. And again, there was a lot of regional variation with this as well, with very low estimates from Eastern Europe, South Asia and Australasia, while three quarters of people from Latin America had recently used cocaine. In terms of the routes of administration, the pattern's quite similar to it was for amphetamines, um, with about half of people who inject drugs estimated to have smoked uh, cocaine recently, and then just under a quarter having injected. For um, cannabis, we found 98 estimates across 43 countries, although again, no estimates were found for Central Asia. And the global estimate was 43% of people who inject drugs. Um, and there was some variation um, in those countries from uh, just under a quarter in East and Southeast Asia to about uh, three quarters of the population in Australasia. So moving on to um, legal drugs now. For alcohol, we had 83 estimates of recent alcohol use in 35 countries. Though again, we had no estimates for Central Asia. And the global estimate was almost 60%, uh, which is higher than all the other drug types that I've mentioned so far, except for heroin. There was some regional variation with this again. Um, but yes, sort of around the same kind of point. So for tobacco use, as you can see from the map, the data was very scarce. We only uh, managed to find 25 estimates in 14 countries. But despite this, uh, prevalence was quite high. So we had a global prevalence of 94%. And all of the countries and regions that we did find data for were above 90%. So what does all this tell us? Firstly, the limited data availability for certain regions and drug types as well as for non-injecting drug use overall, highlights the need for further research into the global patterns of drug use among people who inject drugs. 
Um, as Paul Griffiths had mentioned this morning, it's really important to uh, consider the complex profile of poly drug use uh, so that we can get a really good picture of what's actually happening with this population. Uh, secondly, although there was limited data, this study provides evidence that people who inject drugs also use other routes of administration, and this has implications for harm reduction interventions. Although provision of injecting equipment is becoming quite widespread, provision of uh, sterile smoking equipment is less common and may have greater legal sanctions depending on the location. Difficulties access, accessing sterile smoking equipment can lead to sharing and or the use of makeshift equipment, which has the potential for causing greater injury. Um, safe consumption sites are also another harm reduction intervention that could be aimed at people who use drugs through any route of administration, but unfortunately, majority of these sites only allow injecting use. <clears throat> And finally, this review demonstrates the high rates of legal drug use among people who inject drugs, with tobacco and alcohol prevalence estimates being the second and third highest in this study. This is very concerning considering the increased mortality associated with the use of both these drugs in people who, sorry, yeah, both these drugs in people who use drugs. Despite this, use of legal drugs among people who inject drugs has received little attention to date. So this review was the first to describe the nuanced patterns of drug use among people who inject drugs globally, and the findings emphasize the need to consider both non-injecting and legal drug use when considering harm in reduction and treatment interventions for people who use drugs. Thank you. Fantastic, thanks very much. Um, were there any surprises from the, the review? Yeah, um, great question. I think the main thing that surprised me was the high rates of um, legal drug use, particularly tobacco. I sort of expected it to be up there, but I certainly wasn't expecting it to be the most prevalent drug or to have you know, a solid 90% of all um, countries reporting that high rate. So yeah, definitely something to be considered in future, I think. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the floor? Thank you, it was really interesting. Um, did you notice any patterns uh, when you were doing the review of uh, whenever these uh, sort of patterns were seen in you know, regional city areas or, or any kind of things like that that we've been talking about today with regards to you know, support that's needed in more specific rural or regional areas? Um, that's a really great question and I think it's really important. Um, Unfortunately, the way that we sort of generated the estimates was to scale up any of the city estimates to national, which kind of loses a lot of that nuance, um, but definitely something potential for the future, I think, yeah. Thanks, okay, and just finally, um, you know, how reliable is the evidence that you've provided? Well, I mean, as you know, it is a systematic review, so, um, I mean, I guess as far as what evidence there is, potentially might be the best we've got, but yeah, definitely, as I said, need more, more evidence is always good. Yeah. Well, you used the word estimate all the way through, which is quite good. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, that's, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our next presenter is um, Tom Santos, who's here. No, it didn't. Okay, and uh, so Tom, you're uh, postdoctoral. Um, what, by about a year and a half or something like that? Um, yeah, about? Yeah, a year. A year? Um, and you originally completed a BA, Biological Sciences, and you were out in the States, I believe. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah New Jersey. Um, and you've got great experience in systematic reviews and meta-analysis, so talking my language. Uh, so I'm looking forward to you presenting, you're talking about the prevalence of uh, comorbid substance use disorders in people with opioid use disorder. There you go. Up and running, there's the, the button. 
Hi everyone, um, thanks for coming. Um, so today I'm presenting on a systematic review and meta-analysis that we did on the prevalence of comorbid substance use disorders uh, among people with opioid use disorder. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the um, Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, who the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm presenting today and on which uh, the work was done as well. Um, Funding's conflicts of interest, cool. So uh, opioid use disorder, we know it's uh, associated with, uh, it's a major public health issue and associated with a lot of health and social harms. Um, what we're showing here is the cause of death distribution among people with opioid use disorder. And we can see that things other than opioids are major problems among people with opioid use disorder. For example, uh, liver uh, deaths are quite high as well as cancer deaths, which may be related to things like smoking or um, alcohol use. Um, and we also know that comorbid substance use uh, is associated with greater risk of harm among people with opioid use disorder. So uh, we have recently seen, think this is a picture from the Drug Trends team, of the number of opioid-induced deaths that have occurred with amphetamines um, in Australia over the past few years. And just overall, when we look at treatment outcomes among people with opioid use disorder, uh, we look at overdose risk, um, as well as uh, in a recent study we did um, on the effects of comorbid mental disorders and use disorders on crime, uh, contact with the criminal justice system, as well as uh, treatment outcomes related to OAT. Um, those are poor among people who have comorbid substance use disorders. So um, again, this is just also showing that in the US, uh, the number of overdoses that are occurring with stimulants, so cocaine and methamphetamine, are also increasing. So it's imperative that we look at um, what the prevalence of each comorbid substance use disorder is among people with opioid use, use disorder. Um, so recently, we published a systematic review and meta-analysis uh, in drug and alcohol dependence, looking at all the different types of mental disorders. Uh, among people with OUD, and we aim to fill the literature gap by doing a similar thing with all the different types of comorbid SUDs among uh, the same population, and we use very similar methods in both reviews. Um, so these are important because many of the guidelines that we see from different countries uh, recommend comorbid substance use disorder treatments and making them available for people um, who are in OAT. Um, and we also can use some of the analyses that we'll look at um, as far as heterogeneity to tailor different services for different populations. So um, our aims for the review were to create some overall estimates for each type of substance use disorder uh, among people with OUD, and then also look at the factors that are associated with variation. So um, the where people were recruited from, the country, um, the number of people who inject drugs in the sample. Uh, we wanted to look at how those affect each type of specific disorder. Uh, just to mention as well, we also did current and lifetime rates for use disorders, and we looked at uh, both use disorder and dependence because they have slightly different uh, definitions. Uh, as far as the studies that we included, we looked at any study that assessed uh, ICD or DSM uh, character or use disorders uh, among people with OUD, um, and we included any sample of people with opioid dependence, um, including those who are receiving OAT for opioid use, and uh, people who used heroin close to daily or non-medical opioids close to daily. Um, we use random effects meta-analyses uh, and produced estimates with 95% confidence intervals. Um, and then we use stratified meta-analyses and meta-regressions to look at those factors like the number of people in the sample, all the different characteristics that we'll see in a second um, for each use disorder. So after, uh, this has been a a few years in the making, uh, considering we found 36,971 <laughs> studies, um, but that's also because we did the search together with our mental disorders review, because we knew that a lot of the studies would have um, assessed both DSM and ICD 
uh, mental disorders as well as substance use disorders, and we went ahead and contacted a lot of different authors to see if they could break down some of their um, estimates by the different type of drug. So what we often found in a lot of the studies that came up in our searches was um, people reporting any comorbid substance use disorder as a categorized thing or say st stimulants in one thing. Um, and so uh, we were able to get additional data through that. Um, we ended up with 194 studies in the end, uh, with about 78,000 people, just over that, um, included in all the analyses. Um, so here are the estimates. Um, <laughs> we can see that any lifetime comorbid SUD um, was about three quarters of people um, with an opioid use disorder, uh, and that more than half had a lifetime alcohol use disorder. Um, and also, lifetime cocaine use disorder was quite high. The confidence intervals for that are quite wide, um, but are pretty staggeringly high, I think, for uh, cocaine use disorders. Um, and still, almost more than a quarter of people had a lifetime methamphetamine use disorder as well. Um, we found that current use disorders, unsurprisingly lower, um, but still remained extremely high in comparison to anything we would see in the general population or even other samples of um, people with different use disorders. We found uh, that more than, um, again, more than half had any current substance use disorder, um, actually almost two thirds. Um, so, uh, similar patterns that we found for dependence, so um, just slightly lower estimates. So. That's one thing that uh, shows the differences in the literature as far as um, the different definitions that were used. We kind of ended up with four core outcomes, lifetime and current use disorders and dependence. So um, it did leave some of our stratified meta-analyses and meta-regressions that we looked at a little bit scarce um, as far as the number of studies that we were able to include in each uh, analysis, but we still had some interesting findings that I think are reliable, um, including the variations. So there were multiple variations, um, mainly by GBD region. That was a major thing that we found. So uh, cocaine use disorder, um, we could see here not a lot of data outside of North America and Western Europe, um, but for what we do have there, the estimates are uh, quite high as far as the um, differences between GBD regions. So we found that pretty much across all the use disorders and all the uh, dependence, substance dependence categorizations that uh, the region affected the estimate, um, which probably isn't too surprising. Uh, we also found that lifetime history of injecting drug use also was associated with um, higher rates of cocaine use disorder. Um, we didn't find too many uh, differences by sex, uh, which was interesting. There was a higher rate of cannabis use disorder among men, um, but I think we did expect some differences, but uh, did not find any there. Um, additionally, we uh, found that people who were recruited from settings out of treatment, so those who were not in OAT or um, in recruited from settings that were not specifically a treatment setting, um, those estimates were higher for cocaine and amph amphetamine use disorders. Um, and again, as far as the breakdown of the studies overall, um, most studies were from treatment settings and most were from Western Europe and North America. Uh, so unsurprisingly, the prevalence of comorbid SUDs among people with OUD is quite high. Um, and it doesn't really seem to match up when we see uh, the levels of treatment that are received for comorbid SUDs. When we look at um, this among people with OUD, this is just a step from a recent survey in the States, but um, just goes to show that uh, comorbid SUD treatment is in, always so available for people with OUD. Um, yeah, um, variations by SUD prevalence, geographic region recruitment setting, it kind of goes to show that we can tailor our services um, in different ways. I think Paige um, brought up something really important as far as um, the amounts of methamphetamine and cocaine use disorder um, 
that we saw among people with OUD and that being quite high. Uh, the harm reduction services that we may be able to tailor in relation to, say, providing smoking equipment and things like that, um, rather than just injecting too. Um, and then reducing barriers of treatment overall for um, SUDs is um, important and providing the resources for OUD treatment providers to uh, either integrate treatment or find good ways to refer people um, to the specific services according to their uh, comorbid use disorder. So thank you everyone and thank you to all my uh, all the co-authors, uh, many of whom are here today. So um, very much appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks very much. Perfect to time, as with all the presenters so far. Um, we're probably going to run a couple of minutes over, and that's my fault. I'll be into tea time. But uh, anyway, uh, any questions from the floor for Tom? I have one. Sure. Um, why, why was cocaine so high? That was... um, I think most likely due to the majority of the studies being from North America and Western Europe, where we know that that's um, higher. Uh, there's also, I guess, and in those areas, there's we see use of speedball, which is um, heroin and cocaine, um, but yet probably due to the geographic variation um, and the number of studies that we included from those regions, because those were the ones that had the most uh, assessments. It's always the states in Europe. Uh, yeah, yeah, we <laughs> pretty much. No questions from the floor? Well done for keeping your eyes open, everyone. I've been watching just after lunch. Mm. No, nope. okay, well that's great, we can move on. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Okay. It's just you and I, Kendall, between tea. <laughs> that's good. Uh, there we go. Now, Kendall, as far as I'm aware, um, you, you've been involved in, in kind of health and research for several decades. <laughs> a couple of decades. <laughs> ah, quite well, because uh, you've been involved in, in sort of health delivery and then also research for about 10 years or so. Um, excellent. And you're going to talk about the trends in the use of opioid agonist treatment medicines for opioid dependence in Australia. Looking forward to that. And please. There you go. Okay. Just use, use that to have it forward. Okay. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me today. Apologies, I've got a bit of a croaky voice. Um, just getting over a post viral laryngitis, not COVID. Um, but yeah, hopefully, you don't have any trouble hearing me. Um, so, today I'm talking to you a bit of a change of track. It's not a, a systematic review, but we looked at uh, trends in the use of opioid agonist treatment medicines. Uh, for opioid dependence in Australia using sales data over a decade. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the co-investigators, many of whom are in the room today. Shout out to Kriana, Louisa, um, Michael. Uh, also acknowledging the funding as well. So in Australia, um, the OAT medicines, opioid agonist treatment medicines, uh, buprenorphine and methadone are subsidised on the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme for OAT. You might refer to it as ODT or OST as well. Um, and recently, so in September 2019, a new formulation of buprenorphine became available, long-acting injectable buprenorphine. Um, and this offers a significant change to the options available for OAT um, as it's a monthly um, or weekly uh, administered medicine versus often daily or every second day for methadone and buprenorphine. Uh, then came COVID um, and in 2020 access to OAT, um, you know, there were challenges anticipated and many kind of policy and guideline changes to help um, ensure OAT treatment continued for clients during COVID. Um, so there were changes such as recommending long-acting injectable buprenorphine uh, to reduce social interactions and maintain treatment for people, particularly in prisons and, and some settings. Um, there were other measures such as increased take-home doses for methadone and buprenorphine um, and even home delivery to make sure clients could access their treatment. 
Um, so with all these changes, we really wanted to see uh, how the landscape had changed over the last 10 years. The national source of data on oat medicines is currently called NOPSAD, um, and that's produced by the AHW every year. It's on a snapshot day. Uh, all the oat that's provided around the country is uh, collated by AHW. So that provides a lot of information, but it does vary by jurisdiction. Um, for example, in New South Wales, they're unable to distinguish between the long-acting injectable and the sublingual buprenorphine preparations. Um, so we wanted to, and you know, there's other variations. So we wanted to use the national sales data provided by IQVIA uh, to see if we could, um, you know, help fill in some of the gaps and add to NOPSAD. Uh, so the study is mainly descriptive, and we did uh, an interrupted time series analysis as well to look at. Uh, the impact of the introduction of long-acting injectable buprenorphine on overall trends in oat. Um, to make sure we were comparing apples with apples, we converted the number of packs sold every month in Australia into um, a measure of client months. So the number of clients that could be treated with that amount of medicine over a 28-day period. Uh, to do that, we used average doses from the literature, recent Australian cohort studies. So for methadone, we used 74 milligrams per day and sublingual buprenorphine, 16 milligrams per day. Um, for long-acting injectable buprenorphine, this was tricky as there wasn't much in the literature. Obviously, the product information recommends the monthly preparation should be given every 28 days. Um, but I think we heard earlier today that, you know, some uh, clients will present every three weeks for a dose, and there's also, um, you know, anecdotal reports of clients being held for even longer for five weeks. So to make sure we were converting the packs sold into the right number of client months, um, we did an observational um, uh, study looking at um, some real-world dosing information from three oat providers around Australia. And this was reassuring, the figure there shows you um, there's two different brands of long-acting injectable buprenorphine, and both brands came out at uh, 28 days as being the most common dosing interval, Pro probably because appointments are booked like that. Um, but, you know, and there is uh, some variation coming in earlier and later, but we were happy with that estimate. Um, so before I get into the results, just keep in mind that amounts sold don't necessarily equate to amounts dispensed or used, um, although because these are controlled medicines, it's probably pretty close. Um, our estimates assume that clients stayed on the oat medicine for the 28 days, um, but obviously that isn't always true, and um, so we might be underestimating the total number of clients that actually access oat each month. Uh, our estimates assume average doses remain steady over the whole 10-year period. The coverage of the IQVIA sales data is really good in community pharmacy settings and hospital outpatient drug and alcohol settings. There's 97% coverage. Um, however, we know that there is some undercapture in some settings in some states, such as prisons. Um, so, on to results. Um, look, this graph presents the trend um, from 2013 to 2022. Uh, we've got methadone in blue, sublingual buprenorphine in rose, and the long-acting injectable buprenorphine in yellow there. Um, and you can see like, the main take-home message here is that uh, the total number of oat client months has been increasing over time. It was about a 50% increase or 33% after adjusting for population size, 33% per capita increase. Um, methadone use actually declined by 8.5%, whereas the buprenorphine preparations uh, use increased. And so this has changed the distribution uh, from the beginning of the study where uh, nearly 80% of client months were attributed to methadone, whereas at the end of the study, less than half are attributed to methadone and more than half buprenorphine. Um, with subling, oh, sorry, with long-acting injectable buprenorphine accounting for over a quarter of oat client months in December 2022. And this is really interesting because the NOPSAD um, national data was only able to identify 7% of clients in 2022 as being on long-acting injectable buprenorphine. Um, I won't go too much into this, just to say we did look at um, trends uh, amongst the long-acting injectable buprenorphine brands and strengths, 
Basically, the monthly preparations are used most frequently, with the weekly preparations used quite rarely, just in certain situations like uh, titrating or beginning therapy and for top-up doses. Um, and the lower strength uh, monthly preparations and the high strength are used less frequently than the middle ones. Uh, when we looked at these trends by uh, state and territory, um, our findings are really similar to, to NOPSAD. Uh, basically, all states and territories' use was increasing. Um, it was highest in New South Wales, ACT and Victoria, and lowest in WA and uh, Tas uh, yeah, Tasmania, sorry. Oh, no, Northern Territories, not Tasmania. Um, WA and Northern Territories. So as I said, these findings do align with, with the NOPSAD data. Um, our estimates are a little bit lower than NOPSAD, um, and this is probably due to the different way we've defined clients, um, different data sources, and also maybe changes to retention over time. Uh, when we looked at uh, where oat clients are accessing their oat, uh, there's also been some changes. And um, so that's another one of the key take home messages is that use um, and access in non-community pharmacy settings has really increased um, since COVID really and long acting injectable buprenorphine. So you can see there that 86% um, of oat client months were received in community pharmacies at the beginning of the 10 year period and down to 70% at the end. Um, you can see there in green, um, that's the uh, other um, settings such as prisons. And you can really see there isn't much use in prisons at all until early 2020, and then it really increases. Um, and a similar story for hospital outpatient drug and alcohol clinics and um, GP practices where there's really steady use. Um, there is significant oat use in those settings, but then it really increases from, from COVID and long-acting injectable buprenorphine. Uh, when we drill down on the types of medicines being used by setting, uh, methadone was still the most common oat medicine used in community pharmacies, and by the end of 2022, 9% uh, of client months in community pharmacy uh, were attributed to long-acting injectable buprenorphine but it's slightly different in the hospital and um, prison settings, where by the end of the study in hospitals, 69% of clients are on long-acting buprenorphine and in prisons, almost all, 93%. Um, so it really shows a significant shift in those settings. Now, finally, um, we did the interrupted time series analysis to uh, look at the impact of long-acting injectable buprenorphine. Um, obviously then, you know, a few months later, COVID came, so we couldn't, there weren't enough time points to um, model both of those impacts. So we've probably uh, kind of captured the, the effect of both of those things. Uh, but the introduction of long acting injectable buprenorphine was associated with an immediate and sustained increase in the total number of oat client months across Australia um, with the red kind of counterfactual line, what would have happened um, without those changes and the blue going up. Um, uh, we did look at these by individual oat medicine, and interestingly, methadone, um, the trend didn't change before and after the introduction of long-acting buprenorphine, it stayed the same, but sublingual buprenorphine, there was an immediate increase followed by a decrease. Um, so we don't have patient level data, but there's probably some switching um, and also just new initiations to long-acting um, injectable buprenorphine. Thank you. Um, so we have presented all of this information by state and territory in some technical reports that are available online. Um, if you're interested, check them out on the NDARC website. Um, and we've submitted the results to a journal. Um, so Kriana, I don't think we've heard back yet, but um, watch the space on that one. And thanks for your time today. Thanks, Kendall. Perfect timing. Everyone's been spot on, and the quality of the slides as well, the presentation's fantastic. Um, we've got a couple of minutes, we're into tea now, so um, any questions from the floor? I'm interested in um, possible drivers for the increase in oat over the decades. What, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, so are we. Um, so obviously, 
the introduction of long-acting injectable buprenorphine has um, made an impact and having that extra option. Um, I think the uptake in prisons during COVID where um, you know, access in prisons to illicit opiates um, was disrupted and so there was a greater demand for oat. So that, that um, kind of explains the increase there. Um, but just kind of more general over time, uh, you know, there's been an increase in opioid dependence in Australia. Um, there is some evidence for that and also um, around prescribed opioids as well. Um, so there's a greater demand in that space. Uh, it could also, you know, there, there could be some uh, reasons around data as well with the IQVIA um, data we've got better capture over time, that could explain some of the increase. So we saw a bigger increase than NOPSAD has seen. Um, so that, that might explain some of that difference. I think NOPSAD saw a 17% per capita increase. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and, and I believe you're, you're a, a pharmacist and epidemiologist. Are, are there many of you around? Because we, we certainly don't have that winning combination. Uh, there's a few. Oh, you got a few? A couple of at NDARC, yeah. Wow, fantastic. <laughs> a few of us around. Bye. There you go. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thanks very much. And I'd like to uh, vote of thanks for all of the, the speakers who were excellent. Thank you.